Stop it, Bill. Stop it out. Didn't help anybody, does it? You're never going back in there. You should not make promises. Hey, yeah. I need a volunteer from the audience. Someone not afraid of death. I like the blizzardy sounds a bunch. down to us a little little bit more. Yep, here we go. Uh, let's open up the tab, 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 tab and see the chat. Hey guys. Yeah, it's cold in Santa Fe. Very cold in Santa Fe. And I need to find my glasses. Um, yesterday was a real disaster. I don't know if anybody was with me yesterday. But um, the thing about me is when I read these stories, it's the first time I've ever read the story. And unfortunately, yesterday while I was reading, I did not realize that her friend was going to die. And it seemed, the way he wrote the story, it just cropped up all of a sudden. And I couldn't help but be emotional. And I am a crybaby. And I know... I said I was a crybaby, but you guys, you really need to understand I am a real crybaby. It doesn't take much. I'm looking for a pair of uh, glasses. I'm going to go get me a glass of water. And um, I will start reading in five minutes, but I need to get me a hydrate, and I also need to find a pair of reading glasses. So I will be right back. Don't go away.
Hi Arbor Day, how are you doing? I don't know if you were in here with me yesterday when I was crying because of the end of the story. And I had to get my hydration. Oh. Yes, here we go. So yesterday I was reading a story from O. Henry. What was the name of it? No, it wasn't O. Henry. What story was I reading yesterday? A Christmas Memory is what it was by Capote. Truman Capote. It's about uh, a young girl's memory of her friend who she grew up with. Or it could be a young man. For all I know, it could be a young man. And um, I started to cry. Because I did not realize that towards the end of the story... It was going to tell about her friend dying and her not being able to make the fruitcakes for Christmas that they made every year. And so, um, so, um, the last few paragraphs. Um, I was crying the whole time, and I apologize, and um, so what I'd like to do is start with cry, uh, reading the last paragraphs uh, that I um, screwed up yesterday, and hopefully if you were in here, um, you'll get to hear the very last part of it, and... Uh, Um, so I'm going to read the part that I was crying through yesterday. This is our last Christmas together. Life separates us. Those who know best decide that I belong in a military school. And so follows a miserable succession of bugle-blowing prisons, grim, rebel-ridden, summer camps. I have a new home too, but it doesn't count. Home is where my friend is, and there I never go. And there she remains, puttering around the kitchen, alone with Queenie, the dog, then alone. Buddy dear, she writes in her wild, hard-to-read script to yesterday, Jim Macy's horse kicked Queenie bad. Be thankful she didn't feel it much. I wrapped her in a fine linen sheet and rode her in the buggy down to Simpson's pasture where she can be with all her bones. For a few November she continued to bake her fruitcake single-handed. Not as many, but some. And of course she always sends me the best of the batch. Also in every letter she encloses a dime wadded in toilet paper. See a picture show and write me the story. But gradually, in her letters, she tends to confuse me with her other friend, the buddy who died in the 1880s. More and more thirteenths are not the only days she stays in bed. A morning arrives in November, a leafless, birdless coming of winter morning, when she cannot rouse herself to exclaim, Oh my, it's fruitcake weather. And when that happens, I know it. A message saying so merely confirms a piece of news some secret vein had already received, severing me from an irreplaceable part of myself. Letting it loose like a kite on a broken string. And that is why, walking across a school campus on this particular December morning, I keep searching the sky, as though I expected to see rather like hearts. 
a last pair of kites hurrying towards heaven. Yeah, but when you can't read the story because you're so emotional. Anyway, we got to pick a new story. And hopefully it won't make me cry. Huh? Hey, maybe... Uh, maybe it just lets me cry. Alright. So there's all kinds of great authors here. And that last story was by Truman Capote. Thank you so much, Mr... Truman Capote, he really broke me up, and uh, I keep, uh, I wonder if Dancing Dan's Christmas would be a better story, huh? Or O. Henry's A Chaparral Christmas Gift. A new one's like uh, The Turkey Season. Or the last one, the crash. I'm going to go for Dancing Dan's Christmas. It was written by da Damon Runyon. All right, I think that sounds pretty good. We'll read that one. Let's see. And it's about, it's about 20 pages long, 25 pages long, which is about an hour. And I really like trying to keep the story in one. Uh, <laughs> and uh, in one bite rather than uh, 229 dancing dan's christmas by damon runyon and, and this book is a, a collection of christmas stories That would be interesting for the month of December. I have no idea what we're going to do. Uh, thank you. Love you, Arbor Day. Um, Dancing Dan's Christmas. I am a cry, cry baby. I'll cry. I'll cry for just about anything if you give me a chance. Okay. Oh, put on the glasses. It makes it easier to see. Hi, huh, guys. All right. Now, one time it comes on Christmas, and in fact, it is the evening before Christmas, and I am in good time, Charlie Bernstein's little speakeasy in West 47th Street, wishing Charlie a Merry Christmas and having a few hot Tom and Jerry's with him. I hear an echo. This hot Tom and Jerry is an old-time drink that is that is once used by one and all in this country to celebrate Christmas with, and in fact, it is once so popular that many people think Christmas is invented only to furnish an excuse for hot Tom and Jerry. Although, of course, this is by no means true. Technical difficulties, guys. Let's try this again, okay. But anybody will tell you that there is nothing that brings out the true holiday spirit like Tom, like hot Tom and Jerry. And I heat that Tom and Jerry goes out of style in the United States. The holiday spirit is never quite the same. Well, as Good Time Charlie and I are expressing our holiday sentiments to each other, over our hot Tom and Jerry, and I am trying to think up the poem about the night before Christmas and all through the house, which I know will interest Charlie no, no little. All of a sudden, there is a big knock at the front door, and when Charlie opens the door, who comes in carrying a large package under one arm but a guy by the name of Dancing Dan? This dancing Dan is a good-looking young guy who always seems well-dressed 
and he is called by the name of Dancing Dan because he is a great hand for dancing around about and about with dolls and nightclubs and other spots where there is any dancing. In fact, Dan never seems to be doing anything else, although I hear rumors that when he is not dancing, he is carrying on in a most illegal manner at one thing or another. But of course, you can always hear rumors in this town about anybody. And personally, I am rather fond of Dancing Dan, as he always seems to be getting a great belt out of life. Anybody in town will tell you that Dancing Dan is a guy with no Barnaby whatever in him, and in fact he has about as much gizzard as anybody around. Although I wish to say I always question his judgment in dancing so much with Miss Muriel O'Neill, who works in the Half Moon nightclub. And the reason I question his judgment in this respect is because everybody knows that Miss Muriel, Muriel, Muriel O'Neill is a doll who is a very well thought of by Heine Schmitz. And Heine Schmitz is not such a guy as it will take kindly to anybody dancing more than once and a half with a doll that he thinks well of. Hmm. Sounds like a girlfriend-boyfriend problem. Well, anyway, as Dancing Dan comes in, he weighs up the joint in one quick peek, and then he tosses the package he is carrying into a corner where it goes plunk, as if there is something very heavy in it, and then he steps up to the bar alongside of Charlie and me and wishes to know what we are drinking. Naturally, we start boosting hot Tom and Jerry to Dancing Dan, and he says he will take a crack at it with us, and after one crack, Dancing Dan says he will have another crack, and Merry Christmas to us with it, and the first thing anybody knows, it is a couple of hours later, and we are all still having cracks at the hot Tom and Jerry with Dancing Dan, and Dan says he never drinks anything so soothing in his life. In fact, Dancing Dan says he will recommend Tom and Jerry to everybody he knows. Only he does not know anybody good enough for Tom and Jerry, except maybe Miss Muriel O'Neill, and she does not drink anything with drugstore rye in it. Well, several times we are drinking this Tom and Jerry, customers come to the door of Good Time Charlie's Little Speakeasy and knock. But by now, Charlie is commencing to be afraid they will wish Tom and Jerry, too, and he does not feel he will have enough for ourselves. So he sang, hangs out a sign which says, Closed on account of Christmas. And the only one he will let in is a guy by the name of Oki, who is nothing but an old rumdum and is going around all week dressed like Santa Claus and carrying a sign advertising Mo. Lewinsky's clothing joint around in 6th Avenue. This Oki is still wearing his Santa Claus outfit when Charlie lets him in. And the reason Charlie permits such a character as Oki in his joint is because Oki does the porter work for Charlie when he is not Santa Claus for Mo Lewinsky, such as sweeping out and washing the glasses and one thing and another. Hydrate time. Needed that. All right, let's see. Okay. Well, it's about 9.30 when Oki comes in, and his puppies are aching, and he is all petered out generally from walking up and down and here and there with his sign. For any time a guy is Santa Claus for Mo Lewinsky, he must earn his dough. In fact, Oki is so fatigued and his puppies hurt him so much that Dancing Dan and Good Time Charlie and all and I all feel very sorry for him and invite him to have a few mugs of hot Tom and Jerry with us and wish him plenty of Merry Christmas. But old Oki is not accustomed to Tom and Jerry and after about the fifth mug, he folds up in a chair. Fifth mug? How many mugs did these guys drink? 
After the fifth mug, Old Oki is not accustomed to Tom and Jerry, and after about the fifth mug, he folds up in a chair and goes to right, right to sleep on us. He is wearing a pretty good Santa Claus makeup, what with a nice red suit trimmed with white cotton and a wig and false no nose and a long white whiskers and a big sack stuffed with excelsior on his back. And if I do not know, Santa Claus is not apt to be such a guy as will snore loud enough to rattle the windows. I will think Oki is Santa Claus, sure enough. Well, we forget Oki and let him sleep and go on with our hot Tom and Jerry. In the meantime, we tried to think up a few songs appropriate to Christmas. And Dancing Dan finally renders my dad's dinner pail in a nice bar baritone and very loud. Well, I do first rate with, Will you love me in December as you do in May? After midnight, Dancing Dan wishes to see how he looks as Santa Claus. So good time Charlie and I help Dancing Dan pull off Oki's outfit and put it on Dan. And this is as easy as Oki only has his Santa Claus outfit over his ordinary clothes. And he does not even wake up when we are undressing him of the Santa Claus uniform. Well, I wish to say, I see many a Santa Claus in my time, but I never see a better looking Santa Claus than Dancing Dan, especially after he gets the wig and white whiskers fixed just right, and we put a sofa pillow that good time Charlie happens to have around the joint for the cat to sleep on down his pants to give Dancing Dan a nice fat stomach such as Santa Claus is bound to have. Well, Charlie finally says, it's a great pity we do not know where there are some stockings hung up somewhere because then, he says, you could go around and stuff things in these stockings. As I always hear, this is the main idea of a Santa Claus. But Charlie says, I do not suppose anybody in this section has any stockings hung up, or if they have, he says, he says the chances are they are so full of holes they will not hold anything anyway. Charlie says, even if there are any stockings hung up, we do not have anything to stuff in them. Although, personally, he says, I will gladly donate a few pints of scotch. I'm going to put scotch in the, <sighs> in the stockings. Well, I'm pointing out that we have no reindeer and that a Santa Claus is bound to look like a terrible sap if he goes around without any reindeer. But Charlie's remarks seem to give Dancing Dan an idea, for all of a sudden he speaks up as follows. Why, Dancing Dan says, I know where a stocking is hung up. It's hung up at Miss Muriel O'Neill's flat over here in West 49th Street. This stocking is hung up by nobody but, but a party by the name of Gammer O'Neill, who is Miss Muriel O'Neill's grandmama. Dancing Dan says, Gammer O'Neill is going on 90 odd, he says. And Miss Muriel O'Neill tells me she cannot hold out much longer, what with one thing and another, including being a little childish in spots. Now Dancing Dan says, I remember Miss Muriel O'Neill is telling me just the other night how Gammer O'Neill hangs up her stockings on Christmas Eve all her life. And, he says, I judge from what Miss Muriel O'Neill says that the old doll always believes Santa Claus will come along some Christmas and fill the stocking full of beautiful gifts. But, Dancing Dan says, Miss Muriel O'Neill tells me Santa Claus never does this. Although Miss Muriel O'Neill personally always takes a few gifts home and pops them into the stocking to make Gammer O'Neill feel better. But of course, Dancing Dan says, these gifts are nothing much, because Miss Muriel O'Neill is very poor and proud, and also good, and will not take a dime off of anybody, and I can lick the guy who says she will. Now, Dancing Dan goes on. It seems that, well, Gammer O'Neill is very happy to get whatever she finds in her stocking on Christmas morning. 
She does not understand why Santa Claus is not more liberal. And, he says, Miss Muriel O'Neill is saying to me that she only wishes she could give Gammer O'Neill one really big Christmas before the old doll puts her checks back in the rack. So Dancing Dan states, here's a job for us. Miss Muriel O'Neill and her grandmama live all alone in this flat over in West 49th Street, he says. At such an hour as this, Miss Muriel O'Neill is bound to be working, and the chances are Gammer O'Neill is sound asleep, and we will just hop over there, and Santa Claus will fill up her stocking with beautiful gifts. Well, they just said they didn't have nothing. What are they going to put in her stocking? Oh, I need water. I love you, Arbor Day. Well, I say, I do not see where we are going to get any beautiful gifts at this time of night, what with all the stores being closed, unless we dash into an all-night drugstore and buy a few bottles of perfume and a bum toilet set, as guys always do when they forget about their ever-loving wives, until after store hours on Christmas Eve. But Dancing Dan says, never mind about this, but let us have a few more Tom and Jerry's first. So we have a few more Tom and Jerry's, and then Dancing Dan picks up the package. He heaves it into the corner and dumps most of the excelsior out of Oki Santa Claus' sack and puts the bundle in, and good old Tom, Time Charlie turns out all the lights but one and leaves a bottle of scotch on the table in front of Oki for a Christmas gift, and away we go. Personally, I regret very much leaving the hot Tom and Jerry, but then... I am also very enthusiastic about going along to help Dancing Dan play Santa Claus, while Good Time Char Charlie is practically overjoyed, as it is the first time in his life Charlie is ever mixed up in so much holiday spirit. As we go up Broadway, headed for 49th Street, Charlie and I see many citizens we know and give them a large hello and wish them Merry Christmas and some of these citizens shake hands with Santa Claus, not knowing he is nobody but dancing down. Although later I understand there is some gossip among these citizens, because they claim a Santa Claus with such a breath on him as our Santa Claus has it a little out of line. Uh, he's been drinking Tom and Jerry's all night, and they didn't sound like they had a few. They had a lot. And once we are somewhat embarrassed when a lot of little kids going home with their parents from a late Christmas party somewhat gather about Santa Claus with shouts of childish glee and some of them wish to climb up Santa Claus's legs. Naturally, Santa Claus gets a little peevish and calls them a few names. And one of the parents come up, comes up and wishes to know what is the idea of Santa Claus using such language. And Santa Claus takes a punch at the parent, all of which is no doubt astonishing to the little kids who have an idea of Santa Claus as a very kindly old guy. Well, finally we arrive in front of the place where Dancing Dan says Miss Muriel O'Neill and her grandmama live, and it is nothing but a tenement house not far back of Madison Square Garden. And furthermore, it is a walk-up. And at this time, there are no lights burning in the joint except a gas jet in the main hall. And by the light of this jet, we look at the names on the letter boxes, such as you always find in the hall of these joints. And we see that Miss Muriel O'Neill and her grandmama live on the fifth floor. They have a walk. This is the top floor. And personally, I don't like the idea of walking up five flights of stairs and and I am willing to let Dancing Dan and Good Time Charlie go, but Dancing Dan insists we must all go. And finally, I agree because Charlie is commencing to argue that the right way for us to do is to get on the roof and let Santa Claus go down a chimney and is making so much noise, I'm afraid he will wake somebody up. So up the stairs we climb, and finally we come to a door on the top floor that has a little card on the slot that says O'Neill. So we know we reach our destination. 
dancing Danforth tries the knob, and right away the door opens, and we are in a little two or three room fat, fat, flat, two or three room flat, with not much furniture in it, and what furniture there is, it is very poor. One single gas jet is burning near a bed in a room just off the door. The door opens, and by this light we see a very old doll is sleeping on the bed. So we ju judge that this is nobody but Gammer O'Neill. On her face is a large smile, as if she's dreaming of something very pleasant. On a chair at the head of the bed is hung a long black stocking, and it seems to be such a stocking as often patched and mended, so I can see what Miss Muriel O'Neill tells Dancing Dan about her grandmama hanging up her stop stocking is really true, although up to this time I have my doubts. Finally, Dancing Dan unslings the sack on his back and takes out his package and unties this package, and all of a sudden out pops a raft of big diamond bracelets and diamond rings and diamond brooches and diamond necklaces, and I do not know what else in the way of diamonds. And Dancing Dan and I begin to stuff, begin stuffing these diamonds into the stocking, and good time Charlie pitches in and helps us. There are enough diamonds to fill the stocking to the muzzle, and it is no small snocky stocking at that, and I judge that Gammer O'Neill has a pretty fair set of bunting sticks when she is young. In fact, there are so many diamonds that we have enough left over to make a nice little pile on the chair after we fill the stocking plum up, leaving a nice diamond-studded vanity case sticking out the top where we figure it will hit Gamma O'Neill's eye when she wakes up. And it's not until I get out in the fresh air again that all of a sudden I remember seeing large headlines in the afternoon papers about a 500G stick up in the afternoon of one of the biggest diamond merchants in Maiden Lane while he is sitting in his office. And I also recall once hearing rumors that Dancing Dan was one of the best lone hand get em up guys in the world. Naturally, I commence to wonder if I am the proper company when I'm with Dancing Dan, even if he is Santa Claus. So I leave him on the next corner arguing with good time Charlie about whether they ought to go and find some more presents somewhere and look for other stockings to stuff and I hasten on home and get to bed. <laughs> I know but I'm hydrating baby. Oh, thank you. I'm trying to remember just take a sip of water and thank you for reminding me Arbor. Okay, and in fact, he goes to bed. Where is he going to bed? Wait. Um. The next day, I find I have such a noggin <laughs> hangover that I do not care to stir around. In fact, I do not stir around much for a couple of weeks. Then one night, I drop around to good time Charlie's little speakeasy and asked Charlie what is doing. Well, Charlie says many things are doing, and personally, he says, I'm greatly surprised. I do not see you at Grandma O'Neill's wake. You know, Gamma O'Neill leaves this wicked old world a couple of days after Christmas. Good time, Charlie says, and he says, Miss Muir O'Neill states that Dog, Mo Dog Moggs claims it, uh, it is at least a day after she's entitled to go but she is sustained, Charlie says, by great happiness in finding her stockings filled with beautiful gifts on Christmas morning. According to Miss Muriel O'Neill, Charlie says, Gamma O'Neill dies practically convinced that there's a Santa Claus. Although, of course, he says, Miss Muriel O'Neill does not tell her that the real owner of the gifts, an all right guy by the name of Shapiro, leaves the gifts with her. After Miss Muriel O'Neill notifies him of the finding of same, it seems, Charlie says, that this Shapiro is a tender-hearted guy who is willing to help Gammer O'Neill with us a little longer when Doc Moggs says leaving the gifts with her will do it. 
So Charlie says, everything's quite all right as the coppers cannot figure anything except maybe the rascal who takes the gifts from Shapiro gets conscious stricken and leaves them in the first place he can. And Miss Muriel O'Neill receives a 10 G's reward for finding the gifts and returning them. And Charlie says, I hear Dancing Dan is in San Francisco and is figuring on reforming and becoming a dancing teacher so he can marry Miss Muriel O'Neill. And of course, he says, we all hope and trust that she never learned any details of Dancing Dan's career. Hi, Stone for you. Happy New Year. Big hearts, darling. Well, almost finishing the story about, um, what is it called? Dancing Dan. Dancing Dan's Christmas. Well, it is Christmas Eve a year later that I run into a guy by the name of Shotgun Sam, who's mobbed up with Heine Schmitz in Harlem, and who is a very, very obnoxious character indeed. Well, 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 Shotgun says, the last time I see you is another Christmas like Eve like this, and you are coming out of good time Charlie's joint, and he says you certainly have your pots on, well, Shotgun, I said, I'm sorry you get such a wrong impression of me, but the truth is, I say, on the occasion you speak of, I'm suffering from a dizzy feeling in my head. It's all right with me, Shotgun says. I have a tip. This guy, Dancing Dan, is in good time, Charlie's, the night I see you and Mocky Morgan and Gunner Jack and me are casing the joint because he says... Heine Schmitz is all sort up at Dan over some doll. Although, of course, Shotgun says it's all right now, as Heine has another doll. Anyway, he says, we never get to see Dancing Dan. We watch a joint from 6.30 in the evening until daylight Christmas morning, and nobody goes in all night but old Uki, the Santa Claus guy in his Santa Claus makeup. And Shogun says that nobody comes out except you and Good Time Charlie and Oki. Well, Shotgun says, it's a great break for Dancing Dan. He never goes in or comes out of Good Time Charlie's at that. Because he says we're waiting for him on the second floor front of the building across the way with some nice little sawed-offs. And are under orders from Heine not to miss... Well, Shotgun, I say, Merry Christmas. Well, all right, Shotgun says, Merry Christmas. Oh, my goodness. What a story. It was Dancing Dan's way of getting out of trouble because those guys were going to shoot him. And he dressed up like a Santa Claus. He left Oki all hung over because he got him drunk. And then they got rid of the diamonds in and, and Mrs. Miss O'Neill's grandma's black stocking. What a story! Wasn't that amazing? I like that story. Thanks, Arbor Day. Well, let's see who's out there. I see Shine Shine's out there. We could raid Shine. Yeah, it was a great story. So I'll come back with another story tomorrow night from the book Christmas Stories. And I think we'll raid Shine Chan tonight. Let's see if I get her name right. Uh -huh. So when you go over to Shine, thank you for all, for you guys coming in. Oh, let me do this because I really, I know there's a lot of people just listen. So I want to thank Anna Mosey, another TV viewer, Arbor Day 420, Baked Not Brain Dead, Capsis 06, Painfulest, Stone for You, and You Got Grapes. Thank you for coming in and listening to me, and we'll continue another reading tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, and we're going to raid Shine Chan right now.
See if I do it right. At least I remembered. Thank you. Aww. Thank you for stopping by, Big Dot Brain Red. I know the feeling. Yeah. And when I read, it's like the first time I've ever read that story. Yeah. Here we go. We're going to raid Shine Chan. She's building Legos, I believe. 